Assalamu alaikum. I am Aisha Khan, an ambitious, open-minded and proud Muslim woman. Looking back at the Islamic history, it will not be hard to find women who are innovative, leaders or entrepreneurs. It is said that the property of Lady Khadija, the Prophet ﷺ's first wife, financed Islam in its infancy. Islam then elevated the position of women in so many ways. Join me as I set out to go on dates with Muslim women from all walks of life to find out who they are, what they do and what role Islam plays in their lives. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the meet and greet show with yours truly, Aisha Khan. Today I am headed to the Mona Hotel to meet a robust lady who got her master's degree in clinical psychology after she got married and had children. Well, currently she is the co-founder at Hidaya Timeless Solutions. Join me as we get to know more about her story. Riziki Ahmed is a co-founder of Hidaya Timeless Solutions Counseling and Training Consultancy. She felt that there was a need for counseling, especially in the Muslim society. And since its inception, she has been able to touch and revolutionize many lives. To all the sisters out there, Muslim sisters, please go for counseling. Come to Sister Riziki. She has really helped me. I'm a better person. I know how to interact with other people. I'm in a very happy place. And I'm finally at the Monarch Hotel with the lovely and beautiful Riziki Ahmed. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me here with you. You're most welcome. Tell us about your journey into psychology. First, I got married really early. Mm -hmm. I got married when I was very, very young. How old? Ah, very, very young. Let's not go there. <laughs> very, very young. Uh -huh. And um, I became a housewife. I had my children really fast. So I was a housewife for until my last born was in class six. That's when I realized that I was having a lot of free time. And how many children did you have? I had four, but I lost one. Uh, so like I felt I was having free time, like this last born is already in school. Yeah. I'm not doing much, I'm just staying at home. And I thought, why don't I do something? So I applied to do a diploma in education. Mm -hmm. So I did the British curriculum early childhood which was a two-year very hectic course. And in the second year, we did psychology. And that's where my interest in psychology started. Like, ah. I was really interested in the topic, the subject. I really enjoyed it. So I did it for one year, and I really loved it. And that I was able to apply it as a teacher in school. Like, I would understand my child, the students I'm teaching, why are they behaving like this. So it really helped me a lot. And that's from there, I always wanted to study psychology more further. Yeah. So from there, I went to the university, though I did teach. I did teach at Kestrel Manor School for, I think, two years. Then I taught at Premier School for eight years. Then I became a head teacher at a Muslim Academy for, I think, four and a half years. Mm -hmm. And within the time I was ahead in uh, Muslim, I was doing my degree at uh, USIU in psychology. So I did my degree in psychology and then I did my master's in clinical psychology. So that is where my journey in psychology started and got me there. There are a lot of notions revolving around psychology. Uh, do you get questions like, oh my God, can you read my mind? Or it is not according to the Islamic uh, jurisdiction. Tell us about that. Okay, there's always people, anytime you meet somebody, tell, tell them you're a psychologist, they'll be like, oh, so you can read me? And I always tell them, no, we can't read you. Mm -hmm. Psychology is actually the study of human behavior and mind processes. That's how we define it. So we are reading behavior. So it's about behavior. So what I'll be reading is the behavior. And uh, why is somebody acting like this and something like that. So it's more about the behavior. And there's this notion that uh, people used to have that maybe psychology is not aligned with Islam. Mm -hmm. But my experience, my, like, my entire undergrad and my master's, I just felt like psychology has all been borrowed from Islam and packaged as something else, but it's all from us. Like most of what we learn in psychology, you can apply it with Islam very comfortably. Very, very comfortably. What are some of the challenges you faced? Because here you are, you are a housewife, a mother, and then going to university to do your master's. 
uh, it has not been an easy journey. It's very tough. Being a mother, being a wife, being a student, it's all a lot of things in one. But it's a sacrifice, like you need to sacrifice and actually go ahead and do it. Because I felt I needed to be a psychologist, but I felt I needed to have the knowledge and the skills. So it's a, it was a challenge, like having evening classes, you go at night from 5.40, you're finishing at 9, by the time you get home it's 10 o'clock. So you have to have somebody else making the dinner and stuff. You don't have time for any other person. When you have exams, you don't even talk to any other person. You're in the library the whole time. Mm -hmm. When you have a paper, you're researching, you're busy. Like you sort of give it a lot of time and sort of give your family less time. Mm -hmm. But I think my family has been very supportive in it. They were very supportive throughout the journey. Yeah. My children, my husband, I think they were very, very supportive. And that's why I was able to do it. When you finished your master's degree at USI or Africa, mm -hmm. what did you do next? When I finished my master's degree, by the time I was finishing my master's degree, I was already doing a lot of um, voluntary, voluntary work. work. I was uh, volunteering at FRC, mm -hmm. so I was already seeing very many clients at FRC. I was also doing workshops. I was also working a lot with the Park Road Muslim Youth. Mm -hmm. So I was actually in touch with the community and also doing like parenting workshops with, in schools, with the women groups, with different people. So I was doing a lot of voluntary work at that point, yeah. So with no pay at all? No, with no pay. And uh, with FRC, it would be like, like a stipend, basically, but not yeah. a pay, yeah. You are the co-founder of Hidayah Timeless Solutions. Yes. How did that come about? Okay, I always wanted to have my own farm. My dream when I was in college was to have a farm where I would have a, a farm where Muslims can walk in and get counseling from an Islamic perspective and where they would feel comfortable like I'm a Muslim and I can talk about anything about Islam and still get my counseling and not be judged for having the religion because I always felt there were so many Christian counseling farms but we didn't have Muslim farms apart from FRC. So I wanted to have something that would actually capture the Muslims like I'm able to counsel somebody and use my Islam in the process and actually help somebody to walk through their pain and still remind them that there is Allah, they still sabr and everything, like still work with the psychology and the deen. So for me that was a dream come true. That's why I really wanted to have Hidayah and that's why I called it Hidayah. Wow, very interesting. Mm. And uh, what do you do exactly? Do you only counsel Muslim ladies or is it open to everybody? It's open to everybody. I do get Christian clients who walk in once in a while, mm -hmm. though, alhamdulillah. And they tell me I actually wanted to come to a Muslim psychologist. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, alhamdulillah. So what we do at Hidayah is we are a counseling and training consultancy. So we also do some trainings. We also work with organizations. Then we work with individuals. We work with the adolescents. We do family therapy. We do premarital counseling. So we do like everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, my partner is also a master's holder in wow. counseling psychology. So we feel like we have the skills, we have the knowledge, and we always are always reading more and researching more. Like the whole time, we are always trying to like get more and more knowledge. If there's any training, we at try to attend. And we just attended a certification, international certification in substance use professionals. So now we are going to be certified substance use professionals. Yeah. Your job is very unique. You get yeah. to listen to people's problems, and I'm sure that you already have a lot of problems in place. Yeah. What is it like to be in your life for a day? Okay, like you can get a distress call first thing in the morning when you wake up and oh, somebody wow. tells you, I have this, this issue, I need to see you now. So you calm them down on the phone, mm -hmm. and then you tell them, okay, why don't you book an appointment? If there's a slot available on that day, you then slot them in and you let them come in. So our day is usually a day full of talking to people with problems, but at the end of the day, every time somebody leaves happier than they came in, it's usually like a bonus. You feel like you've done something. Mm -hmm. If somebody comes and they had so much anxiety, if they were so distressed, you're able to help calm them down. They're living when they're feeling they've achieved something. They already have like an idea of how they want to work with their problem. You start feeling like I'm actually doing something. So by the end of the day, it is challenging, but we get the satisfaction that at least today I've helped somebody. And uh, 
as I go home, we don't carry our clients home. We don't carry them home, we leave them in the office because we need also to have our lives. Yeah. As much as I may hear lots of stuff that could be very disturbing, I don't carry it home. I make sure I leave it where I left it in the office. And uh, what happens is we go, for, we go for our own supervision because if you don't do that, then you will lose touch with the person you are working with. Mm -hmm. So after every few, two months, three months, we go for our own personal supervision. So yeah. there's always a follow-up system in place. Yes, we do our own supervision so that we can also debrief with all what we have gone through. From your experience, how important is counselling in our society today? Counselling is very important because we are going through a time when before we used to have the community which was like more in touch with each other. Yeah. Our families were always there, close together. But with urbanisation, we have sort of spread. Mm -hmm. We are not together like before. So somebody might be having a problem and have nobody to talk to. So they don't know what to do. Some people could even be suicidal and they don't know who to tell anything to. So counselling now bridges that gap. Like before we used to have people we could talk to. Now at least you have somebody you can now talk to in confidence. Somebody who is trained. Somebody who can pick the problems as you're speaking and she'll tell you this is what I am picking. Now how do you work this out and give you solutions. So it's not about just... To going around the problem, it's also finding out what's the solution here, what are the options, what's the support system, what can we do here, what are the informed decisions somebody can make. So it's about helping somebody to sort of get a grasp of what is the problem and how can they move forward and what are the resources they have, which maybe at that point they can't identify. So you help them identify the resources and then move them forward. So you can actually see growth from the person who came at the beginning and at the the person who is leaving after maybe several weeks of counseling. So for me, counseling is, I, I actually feel like every imam should study psychology mm -hmm. because they are the first point people usually go to when they have problems. That's a strong belief in me that every person who works with people should at least have some aspects of psychology and counseling. What are the most common problems that you get to hear from people? The most common problems like currently we get is uh, divorce, uh, polygamy, like people not uh, being able to cope, um, uh, violence, domestic violence, we have defilement, we have uh, truancy, students, we have mental issues, actually real mental issues where people have a mental disease and uh, I think the majority are to do with the family. Most of the problems are within the family. Yeah. What is your most memorable moment being a clinical psychologist? My most memorable moment was when I was doing an assessment for somebody and he needed that assessment to either he was going to get jailed or be let free from the assessment. And uh, when we did the assessment, actually this person had a serious mental illness and they were highly, highly suicidal. So the report actually helped them like, to get a reprieve from the court. So for me, that was a really great moment for me. I felt like I'd achieved, and I felt I'd really helped somebody who would have gone in for their illness, and actually it would have been a disservice to them. So from the assessment and them getting the reprieve, I really felt this was my greatest moment. Wow, Masha. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah. Well, we will be taking a short break, so do not move a muscle. As in the next segment, we will get to know Riziki on a more personal level. Welcome back. For those of you who are joining us right now, I am at the Monarch Hotel with the lovely Riziki. She is a clinical psychologist and also the co-founder at Hidayah Timeless Solutions. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. You embraced Islam at a very young age. Tell us your journey into Islam. Okay, I used to live in South B and I was a student at Pangani Girls. Mm -hmm. So I met a Muslim student when I was in Pangani and I, I liked her. So she came over to my place for a sleepover and then I went to their place for a sleepover and it was during Ramadan. So when I got to their place, I found her cooking. So we finished cooking and everything. 
And what really hit me was when it was now time for almost uh, opening the, the, the fast. The fast. I noticed people bringing food, small plates and everything. And I was like, we are in the deepest of the slums. But these people are sharing food. They are so united. And from where I was coming from, I'd never seen people sharing food, even though they had all the food. So I loved that about it. I loved the seriousness they were showing about their prayers and everything, because I did sleep over. We did wake up. I saw them waking up at night to pray and everything. So by morning, I was actually like, I want to be a Muslim. Mm -hmm. So in the morning, I told the girl, that, tell your mom I want to be a Muslim. How then old were you? I was, I think, 15. So the mom says, no, you can't be a Muslim. You have to go home and can I tell your mom and then come back with, a, with, a, with your mom or with a written or something. So I said, OK, fine. I told my friend, OK, I'll come with a written document. So I went home and forged one. And next Saturday, <laughs> I came with it. Uh -huh. And the mom was so pleased. She said, wow, you are such a lovely parent. She gave me permission to be a Muslim. I said, Little yes. Little did she know. <laughs> Little did she know. <laughs> So immediately she took me to somebody and I did say my shahada and from then on I became a Muslim and alhamdulillah mm -hmm. been one till today. How was your life before you became a Muslim? I was still very religious. I was actually always searching for deen. I was always jumping from this church to the other. Like I kept on looking for something. I didn't know what it was, but I didn't feel satisfied. But I did feel a sort of connection with God. Like I really loved God. I really loved religion. And I was always trying to make myself a better person, like whether it's Christian, I was trying to be a better Christian, I was trying to do everything, and like I was really trying my level best. And I think from that, Allah led me now to Islam, which Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. I'm so proud of. And it's like my life now is Islam. So I love Islam, and I'm proud to be a Muslim, proud to be associated with Muslims. And, uh, and we're proud to have you. And I love it. How did your parents react to the fact that now you're a Muslim? Of course, I did not say anything. Mm -hmm. I went, I kept quiet. Uh -huh. But uh, they had given me a prayer book, so I used to pray using the prayer book and learned how to pray using the prayer book. I taught myself the small surahs for praying, and I never told them that I had become a Muslim at that point. They only got to know I'd become a Muslim when I wanted to get married. Interesting. After I finished yeah. my O level, because they saw a Muslim guy and they're like, now who is what? this and now what? <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. So they didn't, in fact, I remember my mom asking me, where did you meet a Muslim? I've not even seen them on our street. What are you doing with Muslims? Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, I'm a Muslim. How did she <laughs> and, uh, She was shocked, but I think my parents were quite liberal, like they were not uh, very strict Christians at that point. My mom actually knew that I'm a person who is very opinionated and with a great resolve. So she knew this one, you're not pushing her, you're not moving her. Mm -hmm. When I told her I was a Muslim, that was it. Then my grandma was very religious and she told me, if you decided to be a Muslim, then stick to Islam and follow all the rules. And she really supported me in that. I'm really grateful to her. And uh, that actually gave me the, the energy and the feeling that at least I have somebody who supports me. So from there, I was able to move on and get into my marriage life and start my life as a married Muslim woman. Let's dive into your marriage life. Yes. Tell us all about it. Yeah, marriage is beautiful. I got my children very early and I got them one after the other. So I was actually a hands-on mom the whole time, full-time housewife, full-time mother married i did love marriage i love marriage and i always feel it's a very important component of uh, the society like the family unit is something so important but unfortunately after some years we did part ways and it was not an acrimonious one we did part ways in a very nice way we are still good friends we do oh, talk that's so nice. Alhamdulillah. then i did marry somebody else whom we are still with now and uh, I always say marriage is about patience and understanding that the other person did not grow with you. So they'll have their own points of view, you have your own points of view. It's about meeting each other in the middle. So marriage is about compromise. There was a point in your life where you lost your child. Mm. Tell us about that phase. Mm. That was my lowest moment and my child got uh, measles before they could get the vaccine. He was just turning nine months and he got measles. 
So measles is a very like um, cruel disease, that's what I call it, because the child went through so much pain and eventually they, he died. He was a boy, he was called uh, Jafar. And um, so rest in peace. I don't know, I think I, I lost a bit of me with him. I couldn't take it, I didn't understand what was happening. And um, for some time, I think I was living just numb, like I didn't feel anything, I was just there. And I feel people thought I was very strong because I was not crying, I was not talking about it, I was just quiet and numb. And there was the misconception that she's very strong. Yet inside I was dying and uh, I actually would uh, follow women with kids in town. I thought that's my baby. Oh my. And I would actually follow the woman for some time, then it would hit me and I'd remember, oh, mine died, and then I would go back. I would be in the house and I would hear a baby crying. I would go into the house, I would check, I would see no baby, and I would be like, oh, mine died. So I would take his clothes, smell them, put them back, and it was quite a journey. It was not easy, it was not easy. So losing a baby is something that is very, very painful. And just thinking that you're burying a baby is something like, I don't know, I always feel like a baby is somebody you're holding the whole time and all of a sudden he's not there. So there's that emptiness that you have that is just, nothing seems to feel it mm -hmm. until when I got my other baby. That's when I felt like at least something. When did I sort you get your felt. other baby? When my baby died, I was pregnant. So unfortunately, because of the what I went through, I was not eating, I was not feeding well, so I got a premature baby. So I got my baby when she was 1.5 kgs, she was very tiny. So in my head I was like, I saw when I saw the baby, she was blue, she was very tiny. So I just said that one is another dead one. So I didn't even bother to go and check on her after I got up. So the nurses actually had to come looking for me, because for me I had assumed she had died. And I was saying, now, here goes another one. So I was already grieving until I was told, come and breastfeed, come and feed the baby and something like that. Yeah. So I had to go and express. So it's, it's, it's not easy. Losing a baby is very, very difficult. How did you come to terms with it and accept that, yes, I have lost a baby and life needs to continue? Actually, you come to terms with it because you start realizing that no matter what, the baby is not coming back. After every day, you're like, today is gone. You keep thinking maybe it was a bad dream, you'll wake up from it. You keep thinking something is not right. But after some time, then the reality just hits you that it's, it's gone, it's gone. You need to move on. And alhamdulillah, you start appreciating that Qadr, there's Allah's Qadr. And uh, for me, the fact that I know he is there waiting for me on the other side, I know that he's among the people who will be praying for me to enter Jannah. So that keeps me going. So I'm always like looking forward. For me, it's like I'm looking forward to meeting him and I'm looking forward to having him pray for me dua to enter Jannah. Right now, as we're seated here today, you are undergoing a very severe medical condition. Yes. Tell us about that. Wow. I have gone through a lot of uh, medical challenges. I've been, I always say my empty hand, maybe Allah gave me is for medical or health. So I've gone through a lot of surgeries. I've had multiple surgeries. I've lost several organs from my body. And all along, like from around, I would say around 10 years or six years back, I had a condition that had no diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was always being told colitis, gastritis, and uh, chronic pain. That means chronic pain, I get admitted, I'd leave the hospital. And that went on for quite some time until in 2016, I went in around four times. I was admitted more than four times. And the whole time there was no diagnosis, like I would do so many scans, so many tests, and they couldn't actually come out with what was wrong. So the last time they told me you have severe gastritis and severe colitis, and they put me on steroids. So the steroids were quite a challenge. And after I used them for some time, they had to admit me again to stop them because I couldn't take them. I was having a lot of uh, side effects. So after that, after they stopped the steroids, I remember in December on the 23rd, I was just at home, very okay, very fine. And then I just got this very terrible pain. So I remember calling my son and telling him, I think I am dying. And I'm not a person who panics easily. So yeah. 
he quickly got an ambulance that picked me up and took me to Mpisha and I was in a very, very, very bad pain. I've never felt pain like that. So they fixed uh, the one for now putting in the medications. The drips. Yes, but they fixed it in the wrong place. So right. it was actually taking the drips, the, all the fluid into my lungs. And I stayed overnight with all the fluid getting into my lungs, all the medication getting into my lungs. Then in the morning I was taken for a CT scan and then again they put a dye that still went into my lungs. So I reacted from there and I was rushed into the ICU. I was actually dying. My lungs had collapsed. So I was in the ICU for I think three days and it was bad. Then I was moved to the HDU. Then from there I was taken back to the ward. And that's when it was hitting me that I was really, really sick. Yeah. Because I was so weak I couldn't do anything. I couldn't even lift a glass of water. I had to be fed, I had to be done for everything. And at that point, then the doctor told me, Riziki, you have a, a intestinal obstruction and we are really not getting what is going on. We need you to go to India. Yeah. But as you're waiting, you can go home, you can continue with your life as you wait to go to India. So I went home and I thought I'd be fine, I'd be feeding and everything. And then after like a week, I realized I couldn't eat. Like every time I ate, I was in severe pain until I threw up. So I went back again to the doctor. I told him I can't eat. Every time I eat, I'm in pain. So he told me we'd be repeating at CT scan again. So we did another CT scan. And he told me, okay, as you're waiting to go to India, you'll have to stop eating. Yeah. So I was put on a fluid diet and the fluid was just water. So for me to uh -huh. keep taking the water, I, I asked him, can I take with Ribena something that can make me sort of take it through the year? So I was only on Ribena from January of 2017 to April of 2017, I was just on a fluid diet My, of water. And you survived. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. And uh -huh. uh, the thing that for me is, stands out for me is the time I was sick in hospital, all the Muslim sisters I knew, Muslim brothers, they were all rallying around me. They all prayed for me. They visited me. They comforted me. Even when I was at home, like, I remember I would wake up and I would not feel like spending a day. I would be like, why am I waking up? I'm not going to eat anything. I'm not going anywhere. I'm just waking up to sit on the sofa. I can't do anything. I can't take myself to the torch washroom. I can do nothing. Like, I'm just there. Yeah. So for me, it was a low moment. But Alhamdulillah, it sort of brought me closer to Allah. Like, I felt like I wanted to do more ibadah. I wanted to be closer to Allah. And I did not at any time blame Allah for the sickness. Yeah. I kept on saying, Alhamdulillah, la kuli hal. I'd have my low moments and I would cry and I would be like, today I'm feeling so low. But my children would always call my friends and tell them, come today, mommy is very low. Come, come, yeah. come. So my friends would come and then when they would come, would laugh, would spend the day and the, the day would be over. So I'd say, one day gone. So for me, it was a day at a time until when I went to India. So in India, I went with my husband. And I remember the day I was going to India, when I got to the airport, I was very sick that day. I was actually throwing up everything. I found ladies waiting for me. And I'm well, like, they're your relatives? No, they were just Muslim ladies who had come to see me off. And that touched me so much. I was like, everybody has been rallying around me. Everybody has helped me. Everybody has done so much for me. And for me, that is when I actually got to get to understand the brotherhood of Islam. Like nobody asked, who is she? What tribe is she? Where is she coming from? Everybody just wanted to help me. And for yeah. me, that really stuck with me. And it's still with me. And uh, the organization I am with Light Sisters, they were so supportive. Like, I don't even know what to say about it. I always thank Allah for my sisters. And every Muslim sister, brother, like, they all were there for me, alhamdulillah. So when I went to India, I was with my husband, just the two of us. And it's not easy. Like, you're sick, you're in the ward, you're going for surgery. You don't have visitors, you don't have your mom with you, you don't have your children with you. Like, you're just the two of you in the ward, in a foreign land. And I remember the day I was to go to theater, I was very like low and I was wishing my mom was there. Yeah. I was telling him maybe I might never see my children again. Maybe this is it. But this was the end of the road. This is the end of the road. So I told him, okay. Like when I was being taken to theater, I went doing all my adkars, my shahada. I'm like, okay, maybe this is it. So later on I woke up and I was still alive and I'm okay. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I'm still alive. And, uh, Alhamdulillah, my husband was there for me. He helped me do everything because I couldn't do much. So he was doing like everything for me and he was stuck with me in the room. Yeah. And I didn't even allow him to leave the room. 
I would be like, no, you can't leave me yeah. alone. I'm so scared. But alhamdulillah, we stayed there for a month when I came back. So at least I got a diagnosis. So I was told I have Crohn's, which is a chronic disease which affects the small intestines. It's a disease that flares up and can be in remission. So at times it will flare up and can be really horrible and at times to be in a remission. So I'm on medication throughout with constant uh, seeing the doctor and constant supervision with the doctor. So I have to be really close with the doctor the whole time. I have to see the doctor and I have to stick with my medication. And uh, yeah. in case he, it flares to beyond, I might have to take the steroids again. Oh so it's about being a day at a time. And Alhamdulillah, I thank Allah because I've not questioned Allah about it. For me, it's a, a blessing. I keep telling myself that it's a cleansing. May it be a cleansing for me. May it be a cleansing Amen. for me. Inshallah. So for me, I don't question. I say, Alhamdulillah, Allah kulli hal. And I take a day at a time. If I'm well, I wake up, I do what I have to do. If I'm not well, then I will sit and rest for that one day. And the next yeah. day, I'll be up and about. Which just goes to show that we should appreciate our lives. Appreciate our yes. health the whole time. Mm -hmm. And always appreciate whatever problem you have. Somebody else has a bigger problem that you have. Always look at the blessings that we have. What is it that we have that other people don't have? If I start looking at, I don't have very good health, then I will not look at what other things I have achieved. Despite my illness, I've done sure. so much. So Alhamdulillah, I have so much. Yeah. So I think the most important thing is we always should look at the positive sides of our, of our lives. Always remember, whatever problem I have, somebody else has a worse problem. And it's Allah does not true. give us problems because yeah. he hates us. No, it's something it's and he wants to, to test see us. our test. And he says he will test us with everything. So that is part of the test. So do we pass the test? That is the question. Wow. Thank you so much for gracing the meeting with you. You're welcome. May Allah grant you shifa Amen. and uh, bless you always Amen. for the good Amen. work that you're Amen. doing out there for the community. Amen. Amen. We have come to the end of the meet and read show. I am totally inspired and I'm sure that you are too. From Riziki Ahmed's story, we come to learn that when life throws lemons at you, make a lemonade. I have been your host Aisha Khan. Goodbye for now. Ma'assalam. Until next time. The Meet and Greet Show with Aisha Khan was shot on location at the Monarch Hotel, your one-stop halal certified hotel.